Um, my name is Sarita Davis, and I am uh, an associate faculty member in the uh, Department of Africana Studies at Georgia State um, here in Atlanta, Georgia. And it is my honor and pleasure to moderate the presentation this evening for a um, new faculty member, um, Rosita Cierto. And she's going to be talking with us about her research. Um, she is also uh, an affiliate faculty member with the Department of African, Africana Studies. So we are doubly happy to have her with us. So Rosita, I'm gonna turn the floor over to you to uh, tell the people um, uh, the department that you're in, the research that you're doing and what you're gonna be sharing with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Davis, for your introduction. And let me share my screen with you because, you know, I work with visual art, so it's really important for me to be able to show you what I'm working on. And I want you to know the beautiful work that these afro latina artists are doing. So the title of this presentation is actually the preliminary title of my book. Is my third book project and is coming out hopefully uh, early next fall. So it's gender studies of blackness, the afro descent of women in Latin America, diasporic visual art. And I've also wanted to say just briefly, I wanted to thank the Arbor Avenue Research Library and also the two wonderful departments that are sponsoring me tonight. My home department, there is the World Languages Department and also Africana Study that I'm affiliated with. And I wanna also to let you know why this event is so important for me. The first time that I came across GSU in the news, it was because of the protest that happened 30 years ago, where black students and other supporters struggled and made so many sacrifices, put their risk, their life at risk and their jobs and education. And they were demanding many things. And among others, there was the creation of the Africana Studies Department. So the first time I come across Georgia State was during my doctoral time. And uh, since my research has to do with social movement, activism and protest, we were looking at actual protests that had a really good outcomes and positive results. And uh, the results here at Georgia State with the process from 30 years ago was a big example of that. So many colleagues already know, but this was for so many years my dream job. So I'm so happy this semester is my first semester here. I'm an assistant professor of Afro-Hispanic studies. And you know, we're all the legacy. So it's simply an honor and a privilege for me to be here with you tonight. So I'm gonna share with you a little bit of the overview on how I'm gonna structure my presentation tonight. You can see it here on the screen. But I want to begin by showing you some of these powerful pieces of art that I'm working in my book project. Here on the screen, you can see some of the artists that I'm focusing on. You can see also into parentheses below each image that they come from different regions of Latin America. So they have different perspective about blackness and Latinidad. What I wanted to do with my book was actually to analyze how afro descended visual culture represent a privileged space where Black artists, and in particular Black women, can renegotiate their identities and give form to their agency. So when we talk about the Latin American context, the effect of conquest and colonization have played an especially important role in shaping social and cultural history, but also how these artists represent their identity. So what I'm trying to do with this book is examine various artistic production by and about women of Africa descent to have some kind of identity connection to Latin America. I aim to analyze a range of power dynamics representing different artistic texts of the Afro-Latinx community. So in my book, I'm working with photography, muralism, historical movies, documentary, digital art. But tonight, I want to share with you especially photography and pen. Things. So what I also wanted to um, acknowledge with my work is that racial and gender equity cannot exist without intersectionality. And this is why each time chapter of my book focus on culture and visual production that are exclusively created by afro descended women. 
this volume also provides a much needed academic reference because it's like a window into the experience of Afro Latina. And it's focused on Black women that are generally underrepresented literary, scholarly, and cultural discourses. And I also wanted to share with you, I mean, a more personal note, why I came across this kind of research and why I decided to focus all my research on this subject. So this comes from my personal and intimate experience as a member of the Latinx community. My family history is a family of forced displacement and immigration. I grew up in a mixed race family. I grew up in an Afro-Latinx community, immigrant community. And I witnessed early on in my life the repercussion of anti-Blackness in my own community, where family member, community member were treated differently based on their skin tone. And I could notice this there with my siblings, with my cousins. Them just meant that growing up, they have access to basic necessity in different ways if their skin tone was darker and the privilege that lighter skin Latino had in many aspects of our lives. So I wanted to briefly also share with you uh, what is the theoretical framework that I'm applying in my book? Here on the screen, you can see some of the concepts that I use really often, uh, like, for example, hair politics or wake work or artistry as activist work or the concept of the colonial aesthetics and, of course, the concept of intersectionality. I also wanted to share with you this quote that is really important for me. It opens actually a chapter in my book. And it really shows us how art is a form of activism in Black community, but also in a Black Latinx communities. So, and I quote, artistry must be at the forefront of revolution while elevating Black lives and Black material culture and contemporaneously invoking the doing of activist work. Is there that I connect to the concept of wake work? This is a concept that was theorized by Sharp in 2016. And she tells us that wake work is theory of practice of Black being in diaspora. So when she talks about this concept in her book, she gives a lot of definition about wake work, but she read that alongside Black resistance, Black death, and Black artistry. So she shows us how these three concepts are really intertwined and connected. So what I want to do with my book is a critical compilation from artists who are always around some act of freedom making. So we need to acknowledge that Black and uh, Latinx artists have historically turned to collective activism to address oppression. Also, what they often do, the Black artists that often use their art as a medium to advocate for social justice or bring social justice issue to the attention of their specific community. So what I'm trying to do is conceive arts as a part of the legacy of Black activism. And it's there that I connect also in the book with the concept uh, theorized by Juan Ramos that use the term decolonial aesthetics. It's a theory that frees the idea of art from Eurocentric form of expression. Here, Afro-Latina can finally represent their self. And uh, it's for the reason that I wanted to point out that when analyzing Afro-Latina art production, it was essential for me to dialogue with Afro-Latina scholars. They are also theorists and activists in their field and who have shaped also modern and contemporary post-colonial theory and theoretical perspective on race, gender, and class. So my theoretical approach put at the center the work of Black Latina, they are intellectual, professor, and human rights activists who also often go unrecognized in their own academic sphere, uh, like also the artists that I'm analyzing in the book. So that's why I'm analyzing Black Latina art through the lenses of Black Latina scholars. And here on the screen, you can see some of my favorite and most powerful voices in this field from Miriam Jimenez Roman, Lelia Gonzalez, Beatriz Nacimiento, Lorja Garcia Peña, Ochi Curiel, just to mention a few of them. And it's really important also to point out to who can claim Afro-Latinidad, who can say they is an Afro-Latino. And that's why I wanted to just stop one second and clarify that all these terms that you see on the screen, they are not interchangeable. They are similar, but they, to refer, they refer to different ethnic groups. So when we talk about Afro-Latinx, Afro-Latin America, Afro-Hispanic, Black Latinos, we need to really be careful in which space and in which area and conversation we use them. 
For example, Afro-Latin Americans or Black Latin Americans, those are Latin Americans, they are full or mainly of African ancestry. So those are people of African descent with identity connection to a Latin American country. But when we talk about Black Hispanic or so-called Afro-Hispanic or Afro-Latino, those are classified by the United States Census or other US government agency as Black people. They are living in the United States, but they have ancestry in Spain or Latin America and who speak Spanish or Portuguese as their first language. And it's also really important for me to talk about Latin America identity, culture, and tradition. It is impossible to talk about this topic without acknowledging our brothers and sisters that have African ancestry. So I wanted to share this data with you. And when I share this information with my students in the classroom, they're actually shocked. Even the Latinx students, they don't know this information because part of history, part of history was hidden uh, from them. So during the century of the transatlantic slave trade, uh, if you look at the map here on the screen, 95% of the people, the enslaved individual, they were forcibly brought from Africa to the America. 95, they were brought actually to Latin America and the Caribbeans. Just 5% of them were actually brought to what today we know as the United States. So when we talk about Latin America, we need to talk about blackness. And there are now, uh, based on recent study, there are 130 million Afro descended in Latin America, with at least 90 million being just on the country of Brazil. Altogether, afro descended they cover 33% of the population of the entire Latin American uh, continent. And here you can see on the screen other countries that after Brazil have the biggest and the majority of afro latinx community. And now, before I show you the art of this Afro-Latina, they, uh, they show this form of Afro-resistance, it's really important for me to give the audience, like I do in class with my students, give the audience a really important historical background. You cannot understand the importance of their work if they don't know where it comes from and how important it is. Um, a, this really shows us the origin of anti-Blackness into the Latinx and Latin American community. Everything started with the colonial period. So there was the caste system. There is a system, a race-based social hierarchy, and where people in colonial Latin America were organized into a system based on race. It's really important to point out that this system, there was a legal system, controlled every aspect of a person's life. And it has social, economical ramification. For example, it controlled which career you can have, um, social mobility, social circles you can enter, or the education that you could have, or the dress code. So you were supposed to wear just a specific type of clothes based on where you were in the custom. In this casta system, you can also see the picture on the left here on the screen. It shows us who was at the top and who was at the bottom. And it's really important to point out that African and indigenous people were forced to speak Spanish, and they also were forced to practice the Roman Catholic faith. So the people at the top were the people that have the most power and the most privilege, while those at the bottom, they didn't have even basic human rights. And how it worked, when a baby was born, the baby was was baptized and was assigned automatically a cast. Then that would be the cast for the rest of their life. They couldn't move up or down during their life. Even after the conquest, race was a sure indicator of a person's social class. So the caste system was a legal system and it was imposed by the Spanish crown within its empire. And within this system, the purity of one's blood, so basically how white one was, determined this social standing. So sometimes people could pass for higher or lower in the caste, depending on their skin tone. And they could also wear different clothes who have different jobs if they can actually move in this way in the caste. To understand Afro-Latinx art, it's also important to understand how this caste work to understand why it's so important to talk about this kind of art. At the top of this pyramid of this social class, we have European born white individuals. They were Spanish colonists and those were the elite of the society. Um, those people held uh, higher ranks in the church, in army or government. They were born in Europe and then they were moved to New Spain. New Spain was today central and southern Mexico. And 
right after them in the second level of colonial society, we had Criollos. Those were Spanish descended born in the America. So they were basically colonial born white. They owned mines and ranches. Many of those families were extremely wealthy and rich. They belonged to the really high nobility and of the Spanish empire, but they were usually appointed to lower level government jobs. So I wanted to point out that by physical appearance, this cast was indistinguishable, completely the same physically by, uh, if compared with the European born white individual, but the mere fact that they were born in Latin America and not in Europe already put them in a lawyer cast. And although Criollo were legally eligible to all the offices and all the jobs, there is already some discrimination for not being born in Europe. And going down this pyramid, there were the mixed blood or mestizo. These people were the offspring of Spanish and native people. So people that have one Indian or native parent and one Spanish parent. After the conquest, mixed race children needed to make a choice. So they needed to decide in which group they wanted to stand. And of course, if they have lighter skin, it was easier for them to be put in the Spanish category. So the majority of the mestizo could not aspire to high status because a high percentage of them was illegitimate. So basically, many of them were the result of rape. And going down this pyramid, we found the mulatto. There was the first generation of children from a Spanish and an African parent. And it was already a really complicated situation because children that were born in this caste could be born into slavery because of their African ancestry. And going down in the second last place of the pyramid, we have Native American Indians. Those were the original inhabitants of the Americas. In 1519, we could count 25 million just in central Mexico. And by 1650, the population declined to 1 million or less. It's there that the slave trade initiated to replace all these indigenous people that were killed. And here's the is the most important fact that I want to underline about this pyramid. At the real bottom, they were the African or enslaved people. These were people of full African descent. Their law social status was enforced legally. So they were prohibited by law from many jobs positions, from having an education, or from entering specific social circles. And I want to point out also another event that really make you understand why anti-Blackness is rooted into the Latin American region and why anti-Blackness is the foundation of who we are as Latin Americans. There was another important event that I need to mention. It's called Blanqueamiento, or winding period. This went from the 1880 to the 1930. And basically, European colonies, they were afraid that they uh, would lose their majority, though, so they they wanted to remain the majority in this area. So the abolition of slavery was a threat to this social hierarchy with them being on top of the pyramid. To solve this issue, they started these processes. There was a mass white European immigration, while at the same time they were abolishing or banning the immigration of non-white immigrants. Indigenous and African people, they were encouraged to mix with lighter skinned people, so people that were higher in the caste, to give their children basically just a better social economical status. But the objective of this process was to have future generations with no visible Black or Indigenous identities. So European colonies wanted to remain the majority and they needed to find a system to culturally and physically wipe out the Black and Indigenous population. And uh, this is really important to understand how essential it is to learn in uh, Spanish classes, in water languages, but in also in other departments, the history of Afro-Latinos. I wanted to share with you also other numbers that really surprise students when we start talking about these topics. So over 10 million European immigrants have settled in Latin America just in this period. 99, 90 percent of these went to Argentina, Uruguay, Cuba, and Brazil. And here is a really, um, a really important aspect. Brazil will pay for the transportation from Europe of all these immigrants. So the white immigrants, they didn't have to pay anything to move to Latin America. They also passed a law making European immigrants automatic citizens upon arrival. So they immediately have really good jobs, really good housing and education. 
And it's important to understand that even if this is history and we have archives and historical documents that show that these still have impact today. If we just talk about Afro-Brazilian, 70% of them live in poverty nowadays. So we cannot talk about Black people in Latin America without analogies century of discrimination, racism, and oppression. And uh, when we talk about this topic, it's also important to point out, and this is also an important fact that shocks students sometimes, you could buy whiteness in Latin America during the 18th and the 19th century. So European colonies put an actual monetary value on being white. So they put a price on abusing human rights. You could petition to the King of Spain or pay a large fee to be exempt from their non-white status. And of course, not everyone was approved. And here I wanted to show you real quick a document that come from the book that I really suggest you to read is really, really powerful, Purchasing Whiteness. This is a really historical document where you can see how this petition, these requests were made. And you can see how basic human rights could be paid by indigenous and black people to actually have some opportunity and some better jobs. It's not that people wanted to be physically white, but whiteness meant having basic human, human rights, like for example, graduating from college or being able to perform surgery. I'm mentioning surgery because you can see here in the list on the screen, there was one of the jobs they pay for in this specific case. So at the time, college degrees were only given to white people, then the only way to have an education was to pay this petition to be extended for your non-white status. And before I show you some of these Afro-Latina arts, I wanted to point out again why all this kind of art come to actually fight against anti-indigeneity and anti-Blackness in the Latinx community. Because this caste system, there was a legal system, it was abolished when Mexico gained independence from Spain in 1921, but this still have ramification uh, still in place today. And how can we see this ramification with this internal oppression. They manifest in our community in so many ways. Some cases that I can mention to you is self-hate, ordering of our own community, and we can see out of racism, colorism, the fact that many of us deny their indigenous or black ancestry, or the fact that really we put a lot of pride on our Spanish ancestry. And now that I gave you some of the historical background of you and like the audience, everybody they want to really approach for the first time Afro-Latinx art can really understand how powerful it is. Here on the screen, you can see one of my favorite artists. So I don't have time to show everybody that I'm working on in the book, but I want to show you at least three or four of them. Armonia Rosales is one that I really love. She's an Afro-Cuban American artist and right now she's based in Chicago. And here on the screen, you can see her interpretation of Michelangelo, the creation of Adam. That is the original piece is in the Sistine Chapel in Rome. This piece that you can see on the screen received so much backlash when she first published this, um, this art piece in her Instagram official page. And why? Because many conservative Latinos, they weren't ready to see God represented as a woman and even less as a black woman. But in interview, she say that when you consider that all human life come out of Africa, the Garden of Eden come out of Africa, then it only makes sense that you will paint God as a black woman. So what she's trying to do, she's trying to reimagine classical works, but with Black femininity. And she's trying to deconstruct the traditional way of thought, the fact that we always imagine God as a white man. I also wanted to show you another uh, piece that I really loved by the same artist is the one that you can see now on the screen called The Birth of Oshun. Uh, she produced this piece in 2017. And uh, reimagine another important and original art piece, the Botticelli work called Birth of Venus. She is placing this time Oshun, the Yoruba goddess of fertility, sensuality, and prosperity at the center. She is seen here, uh, like you can see in a seashell, and is surrounded by black angels. If we contrast this image with the original Botticelli painting, we can remember that uh, Botticelli represented a white Venus, the goddess of love, beauty, and fertility. And she also was in a seashell, but surrounded by white angels.
So what the artist wanted to do here, it wasn't meant to challenge the perception of beauty because she said, and uh, I really love this interview that they did to the artist. She said, traditionally, we see Venus as this beautiful woman with this flowing long hair. But she said, my hair never flowed. So I'm wondering why this was supposed to be, this was supposed to be the painting of the most beautiful woman in the world. There are so many things that are going on in this particular image. But I also wanted to point out how she wants to really uh, challenge the stereotypes of beauty and how she wants to focus on imperfection. So if you look at the Venus, the black Venus in the middle, she is also using patches of vitiligo. There is this skin condition that is more noticeable when it's in people with darker skin. And I want to show you a last piece by the same artist called The Virgin, is the one that now you can see on the screen. It's really important because she represents the Virgin Mary and baby Jesus in, uh, in black as black people. And what she wants to actually challenge here is the aspect of religion and power. She also mentioned in an interview that religion and power go hand in hand. Uh, because colonies had used religion to manipulate and control indigenous and enslaved African populations. So I wanna show you another artist that I really love and that I work with in my book. This one is Susanna Pilar. Susanna Pilar was born in Havana. She is currently living and working in Havana as well. Her work focuses on the body and she works with issues of race and gender. Uh, she suffers so many trauma growing up. She's telling us this issue in many interviews and she wants to focus especially on the violence uh, that the state has on the woman body, but especially the black woman in Cuba. Here in the image, you can see that she is tied. So she is using photo as an art medium, and here is represented herself. So the woman that you see in the screen in the photograph is the artist itself. You can see there is a bow tied with a cord on her waist, and it's in black and white. And what she wanted to talk about visually with this piece, uh, she wanted to talk about the detachment from the, uh, the African motherland. She also wanted to talk about the trauma of separation, and the notion of feeling split between these two continents, Africa and the Americas. This topic, the topic of the notion of split is also used by other artists that I'm working with. And here you can see another example with Maria Magdalena Campus Pons. She's another artist that I'm really interested in analyzing and uh, that I also try to interview personally. She's a Cuba born artist as well. And she's based now in Nashville, Tennessee. So she's actually really close to us. She is working primarily with photography, with performance, audiovisual media, and sculpture. And here in the uh, on the screen, you can see that this particular uh, piece by her constitutes a photographic installation where there are two figures. Uh, these two images actually represent the artist herself. So both are the artist. They appear joined by their hair, and you can see that there is. A blue background and you can see the both women there is the artist herself they are holding this boat with four car sailors these four sailors are actually yoruba gods so you can see how the hair becomes a bridge between these two regions again america and africa and we have this element of connection with the ancestors the concept of hair, you can see, is already is already really common throughout the analysis of all these artists. And I wanted to show you one last artist, Liliana Angulo Cortez, because she also retouched again on this topic of hair as political and as symbol of activism. Liliana Angulo Cortez is an afro descended plastic artist. She's born in Bogota, so she's actually working from Bogota, Colombia. And she investigates the body to talk about issues of gender, ethnicity, language, history, and politics. She worked to investigate discourses of archives or resistance, and also to visibilize the Afro-Colombians in the Colombian region. She used a combination of photography, installation, and she also wants to challenge the stereotypes of blackness because she wants to say uh, blackness is not a monolithic in Latin America. It is a multiplicity and we need to appreciate it for the way it is. This photograph that you see on the screen, it comes from the series called Quieto Pelo, where she documents the historical, political, and cultural value of braided hair designs in Colombia.
So Chieto Pelo is a collective creation project that aims to document how oral tradition and practices are actually associated, especially in Colombia, with her styles. So she shows how political actions are spread through her among Afro-descended women in different regions of Colombia, but also in different regions of Latin America. So to understand how powerful is the fact that she is putting her styles at the center of her art, I need to share with you another important historical event. Afro-Colombian women and breeding escape maps. So what was happening is late Afro-Colombian women starting the 15th century, they used their hair to draw escape maps and to secretly communicate with their community and with their culture. So what they were doing, you can see here on the screen some of the hairstyle that they used. They observed their surroundings and then they were build maps with their braids. So they were able to mark roads, escape routes, trails, large trees, for example, wooded area, rivers, mountains, and those, all, all these hairstyles became escape groups codes for them to be used and to be able to escape. I wanted to, I wanted to show you specific uh, hairstyles so that you can understand how powerful it is. Here you can see an example of braids in the shape of a worm, like you can see in the picture right here. In this case, it represented a river. So you can see how hairstyles celebrate the freedom from Colombia. And nowadays they have a festival each year where they celebrate the end of slavery, but also they celebrate the fact that they can create all these intricate um, and colorful braids. I also wanted to mention another cultural fact and historical facts. So when they were ready to escape, they will put food or other uh, really useful uh, items into their hair. So they will hear these items in their braids to be able to survive in the jungle for days while they were escaping. I want to show you another example of her style, the Bantu knot. The Bantu knot was represented by Afro-Colombian uh, to actually show the people they wanted to escape that there was a mountain on the path. Or this kind of braid that you can see now on the screen, it was a thick braid. In Spanish, it's called tropas, but it means translated to English troops. It symbolized soldiers that were in any part of the route, so they needed to pay particular attention. So now that you know this historical uh, background, you are more able to appreciate uh, the work of Art of Lilania Angulo Cortez. So I wanted to show you again some of the photographs that come from the series Quito Pelo Tumaco that is from 2017. Here you can see the kind of hairstyle that they will use to you to hide a uh, food or other item for their escape. Here you can see another example of where you can uh, see, like you just learned, they wanted to represent different mountains along the path. And here you can see how also young Afro-Latina women in Colombia use this kind of hairstyles to represent and to give a political statement. So in brief, I wanted to show you how all these artists ultimately reject the concept of revictimizing the enslaved people of colonial Latin America. You can see how they really well balance a representation of the suffering with a representation of their beauty. I can talk about them all night, so I wanted to uh, conclude here, but I also wanted to share with you uh, an important uh, news that I got just yesterday and I'm really excited to share with you. We actually got um, news by our editorial house that our edited book is finally out in uh, the presses, so it's going to be available soon. And I wanted to use this occasion to give a shout out to all the brilliant and inspiring authors that collaborated with me in this project. All the women that uh, collaborated with me in this edited volume, they're all women of color and the majority are indeed also Afro-Latina. And all the chapters of this book explore the cultural historical themes that we also saw in some of this artistic work. And they talk about music, dance, photography, religion, poetry, power dynamics, colonialism, but we all do it through the lens of Black Latina women. So again, we want to acknowledge again, the racial and gender equity cannot exist without intersectionality. So all the chapters in this specific book, they all apply an intersectional perspective and they want to 
analyze the experience of Afro-Latina, they are so unique when we take into consideration the intersection of race and gender. So what we're trying to do with this work is relearning Latin America, Black past and also Black present, and also work on the region of anti-Blackness. So it's a really interdisciplinary project that you can see uh, if you want to see the outline online. We all come from different disciplines, from anthropology, sociology, ethnic study, Black studies, and they all contribute from a position I privilege because now the majority of us are faculty and activists in the community and they from our privileged place we are trying to also advocate for justice racial equity and cultural equity i also wanted to take just one second to shout out also to give a shout out to uh two different artists that are portrayed in this book first of all uh there is this poetry by afro-latina poet and writer called natasha carisosa she's one of my favorite uh, afro-latina poets and I have a really intimate uh, relationship with her. So I know her personally and I love her. And uh, she was raised by, um, she is a daughter of a African-American, a mother and a Mexican father. And she's talking about this dichotomy in the poetry. She opened with her or original poetry each section of the book. And then lastly, I wanted to give a shout out to the artist, the Afro-Latina artist that created the work for our cover. So you can see here to the top left, you can see the work called Together. It's a digital art piece that was created by Afro-Dominica uh, artist Vanessa Fabre. There is an illustrator that now is currently residing in Brooklyn, New York. So I'm so excited because they are so wonderful and their work is so inspiring and and I wanted to tell you, please go support their art and the work that they are doing. And uh, with this, I wanted to conclude because I think I'm, the, I'm running out of the time that was given to me. But I'm really excited to continue this conversation to see if we have feedback, comments, suggestions, or questions. Uh, this book is still in the making, so I'm currently working on all the chapters. So I'm, I'm really excited to see if uh, what your thoughts are or if you have any recommendation. And I'm going to stop also my screen so I can really more easily talk to you all. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, Rosita, that was amazing. I'm so glad you framed it the way that you did, because having the historical um, understanding is um, is really, I it's, it's just really kind of central to understanding these artists. Um, my, uh, so I have a couple of questions. One, how did you come to this work? What was your journey in embracing this um, research perspective? Thank you so much. Thank you for your words, Dr. Davis. And also thank you for this question. Please and call me Sarita. Thank you. Out, okay. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and thank you for this question, because it's really something really intimate for me, uh, because I try to bring uh, the way that I was raised and the surrounding I was raised with into my research. So everything started when my advisor and my mentor, there is a Black woman that I so deeply uh, love. She told me, you need to pick a topic for your dissertation, for your work and for your research, but you need to pick a topic that you will be able to work on for the rest of your life. So something that you're really passionate about. So we were talking about our upbringing and this is what it feels more personal and more familiar to me. The fact that my family immigrated to a foreign country and they grew up in an Afro-Latinx community these were the people that I really got the opportunity and the privilege to work with since I was a little kid. And it was easy growing up to see how people would treat my siblings or my cousin or my friends in a different way just based on our skin tone just among my siblings i can feel this difference the fact that we were invited in specific places and other people weren't invited we had access to specific places they didn't have their opportunity um, and then art visual art was part of my childhood and part of the way that we used to escape like bullies in those moments growing up in an afro latinx community and always being perceived as the other as the strange one, we use art a lot to actually um, create a community among each other. So we will like do graffiti. Uh, I think at the time it wasn't legal in uh, South America or in Italy, but we will use art. 
as a powerful form of healing. And that's why I was interested also to study art as a form of healing. And I bring a lot of that into my research. Wow. So you produce art as well. I do. Uh, it's not that great like the one that I show you, but it's really relaxing to me when I go through a really anxious or difficult moment. I read the literature behind it and producing art is actually art healing practice. And so I can see during myself that it really works. Wow. Um, I was. Where to begin? Um, <laughs> so um, I've, I've been to Cuba and it was um, several years ago and um, I would hear these stories about how Cubans, like there, there wasn't, uh, they didn't make color distinctions, but when we were there, um, we were visiting um, a friend of a friend who was an expatriate and her boyfriend at the time was a dark complexion and she was light complexion. Mm -hmm. And um, there were simply places that he could not go. But when, I, but when you talk to the Cuban people, they didn't seem to recognize or acknowledge that there was this caste system. So if it is so ingrained and prevalent in particularly in, in the, the pyramid that you showed, what, what do you think this kind of denial, um, where does that come from? What do you attribute that to? Thank you for this question, because these are all our conversation. In class, we talk about this topic so many times. And is a way for us, for my community, for members of my community to actually avoid discrimination in some ways. And there are all these misconceptions. So many uh, members of the Latinx community will say, we're all brown, we cannot be uh, like racist, for example. But in the moment that we say we're all brown, we are already raising a part of our community, our black community. And it's so easy to forget and I show you the number of many millions of afro descendants there are in Latin America. So how important it is to talk about these topics. And there is this book that I always mention to my students um, and that I feel like is a book that everybody should read to understand this issue is Racial Innocence, a Masking Latino Anti-Black Bias and the Struggle for Equity. This is a book by Taina Cateri Hernandez she is a law professor, but she actually showed us how the Latinx community is racist towards our own community, members of our own community, when they have darker skin tone. So it's really easy for us to also don't acknowledge our privilege. So the first thing that we should know and we should acknowledge is the fact that light-skinned Latinos benefit from the, their closeness to whiteness. So those of us that have this privilege, that have lighter skin, we should use this privilege to support the other marginalized members of our community, but we do the opposite. So our work is always a work in process. We are always trying to build together black and brown solidarity, but we need to dismantle this kind of racism that starts with ourselves. So what we need to do is trying to call out racism, even when it comes from family members, from our grandmothers that tell us, don't, they, don't say under the sun, otherwise your skin become darker, like being dark is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can do that just when we're able to actually call out family members, siblings, friends, or our spouses, but also calling out racism when we see it in ourselves, because we I always doing training, workshop, are always in space in trying to grow, but we need to wake up each morning and practice anti-racism, like practicing how to don't be racist towards the members of our own community. So it's a really complicated work in progress every day. Wow, there are so many similarities um, between the Afro-Latina culture and uh, this American culture. I wanna <laughs> encourage people who are on the call, if you have questions, put them in the chat. Um, and I will pose them. So we have a question here actually from one of your colleagues new to the new to uh, Georgia State, Constance Bailey. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. Uh, she asked, do you find there to be a thematic difference between the content 
of Afro-Latino or Afro-Latina men and women. Thank you, thank you so much, Constance, for your question. And yes, that's actually a really clear answer for me uh, because that's what it drew me more to study Afro-Latina itself. Uh, first of all, in the work of artists, artistry in this industry, uh, Black Latinos are more recognized. So if you do a research, Black Latinas are still really invisibilized, but they bring in that intersectional perspective that you can find with Black Latino artists. Uh, for example, they bring a lot more issues of sexuality. So they put at the center of the art a lot of non-binary people or other marginalized community under the queer umbrella. Uh, the fact that they talk about historical events like the Afro-Colombia that I show you, Cortez, uh, she talked about her style. And that wasn't, I think, with uh, Black enslaved uh, at that period. So their, uh, their specific historical event can be addressed just if you focus on Afro-Latina, for example. So yes, definitely there are many topics that are addressed just by uh, women Afro-Latina um, and not by Afro-Latinos. Wow. Um, let's see. We have another question. Um, can you redefine the key terms like Afro Latinx? Yes, and thank you so much for that uh, question. And actually, the Afro Latinx field is the one that is closer to me and to what I'm doing. So when we talk about Afro Latin America, we're talking with, about people that reside in Latin America. They have African ancestry um, in one of the Latin American country, uh, but they are in Latin America. They have citizenship in one of the Latin American countries. And also they can include people that don't speak Spanish because when we say Afro Latin America, we can talk about people that speak French in Haiti, or we can talk about people that speak Portuguese in Brazil. So it's a really inclusive term. Then when we talk about Afro Latinx community, we talk about people that reside in the United States. they are people that identify as black people, but they have ancestry in a Latin American country and they speak Spanish or Portuguese as the first language. And then there is another, um, another term that is Afro-Latino, but with the at, uh, that is actually inclusive, but not really inclusive. It represents Afro-Latina and Afro-Latino, but it doesn't represent people that belong to non-binary sexual orientation, for example. So um, uh, in my field, the position that I'm in right now is Afro-Hispanic. So I should focus on those Afro-Latin American country that speak have Spanish as their first language. So I'm not addressing a lot of issues in Brazil, for example, because those we can consider them Afro-Hispanic, they're Afro-Latino, but they're not Afro-Hispanic because their first language is not Spanish. Okay. Um, I was intrigued by um, the, the use of these bodies, people actually um, using their bodies to create these escape maps using their hair. And I know in African culture um, that uh, hair was very important as a way of identifying where somebody was in their maturation. And, um, but the, uh, the issue of, um, in, this, in this country of uh, folks who were escaping enslavement would often use quilts to tell mm -hmm. stories. Um, and uh, it's so, I think there was a book called like Hidden in Plain Sight where they talk about that. Um, it is, do you find that still to be a cultural retention in the culture that people know and understand? Because I know we, we, you know, in some ways we've been disconnected from our cultural roots. So do you find that folks still understand the connection to their hair and how it helped people escape? Yes, and it, this, thank you for this question. This is actually the reason why in Colombia now they establish this festival this each year. They spend days making these intricate and colorful hairstyles, but also the Afro-Latina women, especially the older women, they have this other practice of oral history where they will tell the younger generation about these practices, also because they don't want this part of history to be 
forgotten. And they want this kind of connection with the motherland Africa to actually be present in this next generation. They're always further and further away from their motherland because the generation, the previous generation were just born in Latin America. And it's really difficult to actually create a detachment with your own culture. So I interview some of these artists because some of them are so approachable. You can follow their account on Instagram. All of them have their official Instagram account where they post their picture and they're so open to talk to you. Like if some of my students want to work with them, we contact them, they're just so open and so available. And they will tell you how important for them it is to maintain this culture aspect of their identity. Language is another one. They will speak in Yoruba. They will teach her words in Yoruba and then how this is still part of their culture and their festivals and everything that they practice there. So I can still see this connection really strong. Wow. So let me ask you, because I, I think there, there's, so, there's so many similarities. Um, uh, I want to understand in terms of, well, I'll ask about that in a, in a second. I have a, a question about, because of the caste system and um, with these um, Afro-Latina artists um, very much placed at the bottom, how, how easy is it for them to survive and, and, and um, get their art out in front of people. So what is that experience like for them as an artist surviving in a caste system? And you were talking about colonial period or you want to um, know also the repercussion nowadays, like how now, is the situation now. nowadays? Yeah. And, um, yes, here in the United States actually it's interesting. Thank you for this question because it brings us a big issue in this field. Um, a lot of Afro-Latinx artists that I work with personally, that I know personally, uh, they show, they told me that after the protest in 2020, a lot of more agency, nonprofit, museum have called them more than usual, a lot more than usual. And they all, of course, they love that, but they always tell me we were always been here. We always existed, mm -hmm. but until this major thing happened, like racism doesn't didn't start in 2020, and that's what they're trying to tell us. We always existed, but there is always so this concept that they are black, so their Latinidad is hidden. So they, they need to negotiate the fact they are not considered Afro-Latino. When people see them, they see them simply as black people. And they always talk to me about the fact that they lose their Latinidad because people don't know how to negotiate the intersection between the ethnicity and the race. And uh, it's a working process. Now um, there is an organization, nonprofit organization, that is called Allies in Arts. Is one of the organizations that I bring always artists that I know in contact with because it's helping breaking these boundaries. It's an organization that is really broad. It doesn't help just BIPOC artists, but also women artists or artists that belong to the queer umbrella community, the LGBTQ community. And it's a way to actually say, we've always been here. How can you support us? There is a list of practices that we can use um, to actually support Afro Latinx artists or artists that come from different marginalized groups. Yeah, okay, so that was going to be my next question. How can we, for example, if somebody's listening to, to this conversation, can you give us some examples of how we can support Afro Latinx artists? Yes, thank you so much, because this question is so important to me, because when we talk about social justice, activism, we really need to create a bridge between theory and praxis. Okay, we're studying Afro-Latinx art, but what can we actually do to support them to be practical? And uh, we talk about all of this in my classroom as well. Um, and first of all, we need to acknowledge that art is the backbone of our society. So it's around us all the time, from the moment we wake up until the moment we go to bed. I come to work listening to my very Black Latina um, podcasters, and Constance actually is now one of my favorite, the faculty that just asked a question. She has a podcast, and now I'm, I'm listening to her podcast as well. Um, then I see art everywhere in the science. I come to my office. You can see all this is Afro Latinx art. It's just we need to understand that we consume art every day all day so we also need to see how can we support the most marginalized in this kind of big field 
So of course, buying their products, but I tell my students that they need to be intentional in how they buy their products. So for example, the best thing will be to buy in person. So just go to, a, to the exhibitions, but also when buying online, they need to pay attention to them buy um, from a third party. They need to buy directly from the website because if you, are, if you don't know, just ask me and I can directly to the official website of this artist. And to take a step further, I teach my students how to leave an online comment or a review because they don't realize how important that comment that review is for their business. So I show them the research because when you show data, when you show numbers, that's more impactful. So 90% of the people that, that buy an artistic product, they actually read the reviews the other people left before. So it's so supportive. So spend two minutes to just write um, a short review even to support them. Then subscribe to their online platform. Many of these artists has a Spotify, a podcast a channel or they have newsletters so we can subscribe to their newsletter we can know when they notify us that there is a release of a new project a new exhibition and that there is a spread with the word of mouth so when we know that you have a friend a family member or somebody in your community they have an exhibition is an afro latinx artist just tell your friend just share uh in your social media for example share a post and, um, you know, when you see behind me are some art pieces that I bought that I always try to support my artist friends. And of course, it can be expensive sometimes, but you don't have to spend so much money to buy like always the big pieces of art. I wanted to show you here some these little postcards that I bought during the Pimont Park Art Festival that was in August here in Atlanta. Uh, I was 20 and 21st. So if some of you went, you actually saw there are so many Bible cards just in the area uh, in Atlanta itself. And this one, they cost $5. It can be nothing. It can, seems like nothing, but that's how they support their business and how they can actually produce their art because they buy their tool. And I wanted to mention Afro Latinx artist that is now really active in Atlanta. So I wanted to actually push you to go and see his art. Is the name is Willi Mendes Paez. He's an Afro-Cuban art, and now he explored this topic of Latinidad and Blackness, and now he has three exhibitions in the city of Atlanta in different places. Um, Do you know the I, names of those places? Yes. So I, I went to one just last Sunday because it was the ceremony of the opening. Uh, it was the Speak Art Gallery in Midtown. It's just 10 minutes from downtown campus from my office right now. I'm in my office in the 25 Park Place. From here is 10 minutes driving to Midtown. It's called Speak Art Gallery. And it's going to be available until the end of February. And then there is another exposition by the same artist at the Atlanta University Center, the World Woodruff Library. That one is available until January 31st. So please uh, spend an afternoon in the weekend to go explore um, these Afro-Latinx artists. is mind-blowing and so powerful. Uh, he's uh, often there, so you can actually talk to him, um, try to organize to go with my students. Uh, so it's really important. So people don't know. That's why I'm saying uh, World Month is so important. When you know about uh, some artists in your community that is doing work, just, uh, just tell people, just keep telling people. We can go together if you want. I would love to. <laughs> um, so I think you, you kind of address this question, but I'll, I'll pose it formally um, just to make sure that we address it. How does your research on Afro-Latina artists inform your teaching here at Georgia State? Thank you, Sarita, for the question. Yes, so everything that I teach is actually drawn from my scholarship, so I can see how they're intimately intertwined, they inform and complement each other, but what I try to do in the classroom, I bring all of this into my classroom, and I want the classroom to become a safe space to create also a direct connection with these artists, because I actually invite Afro Latinx artists each semester into my classroom. And before we invite the artists, we go through this historical background. So for a couple of weeks, I need to tell students, you need to know why their work is so important. You need to know the history. You need to know about the caste system. You need to know about anti-Blackness as a foundational 
element of what it means to be Latin America. So we do the historical content first, and then we bring in the artists. When students are actually now really interested in their art because they understand how meaningful it is historically, politically, from an activist point of view. Um, so that's some practice that I do. And then, you know, as Bellux always tell us, um, the classroom reminds the most radical place where we can change the world in the academy. So something that I always tell my colleagues and students, we should teach Afro-Latinx culture, not just during Black History Month, we should teach it all year around. So I mean, a group of colleagues, faculty, they are like-minded that we are fighting actually to have Afro-Latinx in each Spanish department in the nation. So it should be taught at every level of Spanish. It should be taught in every kind of class of Spanish. And also it's really easy to teach this topic in other classes because of the political content. So you can actually add Afro-Latinx artists in a class, in syllabus, they have to do with anthropology, sociology, women and gender studies, where art history, of course. So you can see how we need to really be intentional in making it part of what we teach to students. And also going back to Bell Hooks, she tell us it's not enough to talk about women of color at the end of the semester or pull all the issues of race just in one module. We need to make race, gender, Afro-Latinx art at the core of our curriculum. So there is a big change that we can make personally. So I also wanted to say the next semester I'm gonna teach a class on Afro-Latinx um, uh, culture is gonna be offered in Spanish, is cross-listed cross with Africana studies and with women and gender studies. Um, but you know, sometimes there is this barrier because it's taught in Spanish. So if you're not fluent in the language, it's difficult for you to attend. But I was, was also able to propose a new course. I actually submitted the proposal uh, for a course that is titled Themes in Afro-Latin America and Afro-Latinx Studies. And that this is actually gonna be offered in English. So it's gonna be open by any students that are interested in about learning about these topics, many times learning about your own history. Because the Afro-Latina students that I work with, the Latinx students, they don't know about this part of history because it is hidden here in the United States. They don't teach about these topics in high school, for example. This is the first time that they are exposed to these kind of themes. You know, it's so interesting um, it's, to be having this conversation about how this content is taught. Um, we have a student in our master's program who has a background in fine arts, and she has been um, desperately looking for courses that talk about the uh, Black artist experience, and they basically don't exist. Um, yeah. It's fine art. It's and I was really shocked to 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 hear this. So there is a real gap that your work is filling, you know, in in the classroom and bringing it to the community. Um, because I, I'm just I'm just shocked that it doesn't exist. Yes, yeah. it's a topic that is also not talked about in the household, like in their own family. They don't want to address those issues of race. And uh, we talk for hours with students about their Blackness and their Latinidad and how they navigate being part of these two marginalized groups at the same time uh, when we could talk about these topics in the classrooms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I have one final question for you. Um, what are some strategies to challenge and fight? And I think it also it's embedded in some of the, the responses that you already gave, but what are some of the strategies to challenge and fight anti-Blackness in the Latinx community? Thank you for this question, Sarita. And uh, this is a really emotional topic for me because we talk about this basically every day in my community, because there is always an accident. Also, some that get national attention. Um, and the first thing is acknowledging that exists. So recognizing that this is an issue in our community. So actually take ourselves accountable in a way. So we tend to deny that this reality exists in our community, but anti-Blackness is prevalent in the Latinx community. I can mention the recent scandal that happened. Uh, maybe you or other here have 
I have heard about this, about the Los Angeles City Council that was in turmoil after uh, many several Latino members made some racist remarks, and especially mm -hmm. was a Latina member of the Los Angeles City Council to make these Latino remarks, Nuri Martinez. So immediately I called my friends, we had conversation, we were not surprised. So when this thing happened, none of us is surprised because we hear these things every day. And unfortunately, we hear these things from our family, our parents, our grandparents, other, our spouses sometimes. You can see how, okay, this may like national scandal, but you can see how this is what we hear every day. It's a bad thing to be black in the Latinx community. So to understand better this, um, this issue, again, the book that I mentioned earlier, the Racial Innocence book, that is so powerful because it's actually, I always teach it in my class, but it's the first comprehensive book that talk about anti-Black bias in the Latino community. So that we can actually talk about and reflect, like reflect on ourselves and how we are part of the problem. Because if you think about Latinx community are the second largest minoritized group in the United States. So we can really easily contribute to dismantle like, you know, systematic racism rather than be a part of the issue because we are just so many. They call us minoritized, I say minoritized groups because we are actually no minoritized groups anymore. We are so many. So our contribution is so, so important. And again, it comes from light skinned Latino. It needs to start from the people that are not dark skinned. How do we react to specific situation? Who do we call in our circle? Who we exclude from our circle? And it's, it's really difficult. There is this concept in the Latinx community that is called mejorar la raza, better the race, where like actually our grandmothers tell us, oh, you should marry somebody that is Latin skin para mejorar la raza, to better the race. That means to get closer to whiteness. So how growing up as a child, how can you think that that is wrong when it's a person so close, intimate, connected to you to tell you that that's the right thing to do? So you, you see how it's difficult because we need to dismantle him from the root. So that means calling out our family members sometimes, and that's where it's challenging. Absolutely. I know um, I've had a couple of students who have done their research, their master's thesis on colorism, and, yeah. um, and so many of the same issues um, exist. So um, there are definitely a lot of powerful similarities and I am so glad to learn of your research. It is so exciting. I'm glad that we're going to be cross-listing some classes and I can't wait to continue this conversation. Um, we have a few minutes left and I wanted to ask you if there are any closing comments or remarks that you want to leave with the audience. What, what do you want to share that has not been shared so far? Thank you. I just want to say my office is on the 19th floor of the uh, 25 Park Place in 1916. Please, if there are students, I know that many students told me uh, they were going to be here and connecting tonight. Come see me. I can show you the resources, especially if you don't know how to be practicable you know, in supporting the Afro-Latinx community. I can show you resources. I can show you where the artists are here in Atlanta so that you can make a fun weekend while you're at the same time as supporting uh, our own community. So please come see me, you know where to find me and I'm always available for you. Uh, sign up for my classes. I was happy because there was some instances where I was able to already present the topic of my class uh, with other Latinx faculty in my department and students are so excited and so interested in this topic. So I just can't wait for the spring uh, to teach my first class and then for the one that is going to be in English that's probably is going to have more audience because students don't have the language barrier anymore. Absolutely. Do you know if that, um, are any of these classes going to have a virtual component? My, actually, my uh, course in the spring is fully online. Okay. We meet each week, but it's online. It's just because I noticed how many students are not even in Atlanta. So they're taking the class from another state and they have so many jobs 
this flexibility really helped me reach also more students. So I'm really glad that it's online, but we will meet weekly. So we can still interact with music, culture. Uh, we're going to have artists visit the class. So there is going to be beautiful. Those conversations are so powerful every time. Uh, so I'm really excited about that. Oh, this is wonderful. This is so wonderful. We are so fortunate to have you with us at the university and especially affiliated with our department. Rosita, thank you so much for sharing your work with us. I look forward to experiencing more of it.